Good evening, everybody. Does this work? Can you hear me like this? Yep. Is this okay? Yes. Good. Uh, I'm delighted to see you all here. I imagine there are a few empty bar stools at Julius's at the moment. <laughs> and I can't believe they actually gave me a microphone and the opportunity to speak about Julius's. But fortunately, I have two friends back here, Sean and Daniel, and they'll be giving me the wind-up sign. Actually, I do not intend to speak for very long. We do have uh, people who have far more to say than I do. I'd like to introduce uh, my brief moment here uh, by playing a short video. So in the 1960s, a regulation imposed by the New York State Liquor Authority prevented homosexuals from being served alcohol. The Mattachine Society, a group fighting for gay rights, actively opposed this regulation. Tom Bernard tells the story of the historic sit and protest at Julius, a bar in Greenwich Village. So what they decide to do is go to an establishment and announce that they are homosexuals and they want to be served. Uh, and their first target is the Ukrainian uh, American fraternal organization, the restaurant on the same place. And they chose that place because behind the bar there's a sign that says, if you are gay, please go for it. The media shows up, they go into the place, they go, what is this demonstration going on? And they say, what are you talking about? Well, they hear what's going on, they shut down. So the managing folks, they say, all right, let's make an argument, we're going to do something that says Julius's. Now, a week earlier in Julius, the story goes that a minister was there, and he tried to pick up another guy. Jail. They think it looks trivial. And they give their little presentation. We are homosexuals. <coughs> we are poverty. And we would like to be served up. A lot of times he's got the sign on the window that says this is a great premises. He very dramatically puts his hand over that glass and says, I cannot serve you. Thank you very much. We have the, the newly found Human Rights Commission in New York City. These homosexuals call that them and say, all right. We're going to go after the state liquor authority. The state liquor authority said, wait a minute, we're fighting a losing battle right here. And they changed that regulation. I think it was putting uh, the establishment on notice that we are here and we're not going to be harassed and persecuted without putting up fighting. Not bad, huh? Gentlemen, Mr. Dick Leitch, right here. Dick, if you would please stand up. Thank and Randy Wicker, please, if you would kindly stand up. Right here. Uh, when we're finished here, when the three of us are finished, uh, you'll have an opportunity to speak to Dick and hear straight from the horse's mouth as to how all that went down and stuff like that. I'm so happy to speak about Julius's. I, if you've been there, you love it. Everybody does. And uh, I started going there in about 1974, and it has become my living room. It's become my home away from home. I described it recently as a pair of old sneakers. Well worn, but very comfortable, and you know what you're getting yourself into. And that's the way it feels to me. The structure that houses Julius's, tech, whoop, that's the, hold on, here we go, oh, uh, here's a picture of Dick Leitch, uh, pre-Stonewall, this is, he's on the right here looking like uh, Tom Cruise, <laughs> right, in the sunglasses. Notice that they're all very well dressed, that was de rigueur, they didn't want to have any sissies or pansies or, or you know, dykes or any of that stuff to not threaten, the, not frighten the horses. Um, and then I understand when Dick took over the New York chapter of the Mattachine Society, he wanted to have a more aggressive approach, and that's when they cooked up the, uh, the idea of the sip-in, which interestingly enough, by the way, to put it in context, this past Saturday was the 50th anniversary of the Beatnik Riot in Washington Square Park that I'm sure some of you are aware of. 
So it's pretty heavy times going on. Some of their earlier pamphlets that were no doubt very, very helpful to the gay community back then. This is all volunteer work, scraping together a few dollars to pay a printer. Some of their flyers, and I pass them around, they're laminated, if somebody wants to, you know, to get a closer look at this stuff. And this is a poster from a monthly managing party that is held at Julius's the third Thursday of every month. And this is the first gay party, 1970. And you see the Manachine poster on the right. <coughs> the building that houses Julius's was built in 1826 at the corner of then Amos and Factory Street at a dry, as a dry goods store. And it subsequently turned into a drinking establishment sometime around the time of the Civil War. And it would have been one of scores of drinking establishments on this side of the village, serving mostly the Irish and German immigrants. It segue into becoming a gay bar in the 1950s. Everybody has asked me how. <clears throat> I don't know. It wasn't like an email that went out one day in, 1950, in 1955 and said, all you faggots, show up at Julius's. But I'd like to think that this neighborhood with more of a bohemian, non-middle class flavor with artists and sculptors and, and writers weren't so threatened by having these homosexuals around them. <coughs> these are two uh, Ouija photographs that we have hanging up in Julius's. And we noted for our foreign language signs above the bar. This illustration on the left is Al Hirschfield from the, the Speakeasies of 1932. These are going to be restored, these, these signs here. I, I worry about Julius's very much. And biggest and, and best hamburger in New York, that dates from 1952, I believe. But this uh, young woman at the bottom, <coughs> On her, the right is a photograph, a painting we have there at Julius's. And I like to believe that's a good friend, Texas Guinan, Mary Louise Guinan, a contemporary of Mae West. She was the hostess in all of the speakeasies in New York City. She was always one step ahead of the law. Her famous line was, hello, suckers, leave your wallet on the bar. And there we see a picture of her on the left. Certainly looks like her, doesn't it? Here we go. <coughs> and some beauty shots of Julius's with uh, decorations. We kind of go crazy for a, whatever holiday. Helen puts them up far too early, and they stay far too long. But that's another issue. This is Helen, my friend Helen here, who's the owner of Julius's. And you really <laughs> Here you see the lamp house that I did the fundraising for some uh, years ago. And the bottom here, take a look at our dogs. We believe that's Julius's, those brass dogs that uh, line the bar, and they're going to be put back real soon. I, I, I love old things. I like touching old things and putting my hand elbows on a bar that other people have done as well, and putting my foot on a bar rail. And you don't know who has done the same thing, whether it's Rudolf Nureyev or Woody Guthrie, you just don't know. So I, I'm all into saving that kind of stuff. And uh, that this is the lamppost. There was an ugly cobra head lamppost. And one night, I may have had too much to drink. <laughs> and I said, guys, what do you say? You want to get rid of that old ugly lamppost? A couple of people said, why not? Oops, a couple of people said, why not? I woke up the next morning, I said, oh, no, what did I do? <laughs> So we spent a couple of years having <coughs> bake sales, book sales, video sales, anything we could do to raise the $6,000 to put the lamppost in. The day before it was to be installed, the Department of Transportation called me and said, you know, you have to pay for the installation. I said, are you kidding me? I said, how much is that? Another six grand. I said, I gotta get out of town. They'll kill me. So they grandfathered me in, and now it's about 15 grand if you want to install one of those lampposts. Mm -hmm. And the two plaques at the bottom here, this tissue bower I make every year for gay pride. 
And over the left here, the installation of the lamppost, I decided to throw in a little beefcake. <laughs> <laughs> it sure was fun watching that being installed. <laughs> and this is uh, just one of my favorite pictures that I believe Helen took on Gay Pride. And to me, this symbolizes just all the incredible progress that we have made. This little girl, these two little girls, in 50 years, they'll be almost middle-aged women. And what will their perspective of being homosexual and lesbian be? And it's because of the early pioneers, such as Dick Leitch, the Magazine Society, Randy Wicker, who had the courage at the age of 29, 28, 29 years old, back then to say, I am homosexual, and I am healthy, and I deserve respect. And what a, what a different world it is today. Folks, I'm going to pass this on uh, to Ken Lusbader here. There are a couple of terrific projects that these two gents are working on, and uh, here you go. I'm going to let him introduce himself. City LGBT Historic Sites Project, uh, which is a project that we initiated with Jay Shockley, who's sitting to my right, and Andrew Belcart, who's uh, can't be with us tonight. But the project is going to identify, document, and evaluate LGBT historic and cultural sites in the five boroughs of New York City. In addition to Tom, I want to thank uh, you for attending and for Andrew Berman and Matt Moskowitz, Morowitz for putting this all together, and Jefferson Market for hosting us tonight. And of course, I want to acknowledge Helen for running the bar, which has uh, become quite a term of endearment now, and Dick Leitch and Randy Wicker, who are here to join us. And um, I'm going to be presenting a little bit about the Sibin in particular. So it's rather odd to have two individuals who created the history in the room when you're talking about the history. But I ask them not to say anything during the presentation and only correct me afterwards. <clears throat> Tonight we're going to be discussing the Sibin, an event that is grounded in site-specific locations in Greenwich Village. But much of this history, and LGBT history in general, remains undocumented and invisible. It's telling that the LGBT community is among the least represented in official recognition of historic sites. In New York City, there is only one individual landmark associated with LGBT history, and that's the Stonewall. And that was only designated last year uh, through the efforts of Greenwich Village Society and among, amongst other people. Equally di is disturbing is the fact that of the more than 87,000 sites listed on the National Register, only seven are listed for LGBT history. And up until a few years ago, it was only one, the Stonewall. This is particularly ironic given the huge impact that the LGBT community has had on American history and culture and the fact that gay men and lesbians have always been integral to, to the historic preservation movement. To address this deficit, the New York City LGBT Historic Sites Project will for the first time survey historic and cultural sites reflecting the histories of the diverse LGBT communities throughout the boroughs. Included will be such categories of clubs and bars, restaurants, theaters, performance venues, residences of notable figures, works of art and architecture, civil rights and organizational sites, <clears throat> and community and public spaces. It is expected that many sites will be related to the arts and culture since LGBT people have been important pioneers in theater, music, art, literature, fashion, photography, architecture, and related fields. The main deliverable of our project will be an interactive, experiential website delivered over multiple platforms containing over 1,000 cultural, cultural place-based sites. This curated online archive will be used by the public to explore LGBT history and culture through various points of entry. Or you can dive into a map, you can go in by theme, significance, or period of time. Our push to start this project began, began in 2014 when we received a grant from the National Park Service for the Underrepresented Communities Initiative. This was one of the first for LGBT history, which was part of our new initiative to increase diversity on the National Register. <coughs> in addition to our map, we will be developing a context statement which will help future LGBT historians and develop public and uh, educational programs. 
Our project will commemorate important sites to the LGBT community at large, but will also document the community's diverse significance. And all New Yorkers will benefit from that. At the end, I'll show a slide which has an email address, and we're hoping you can contribute. We're going to be having various presentations over the course of the next six, uh, six months, and we hope you can attend those. Let me now introduce Jay Shockley, another co-director, who will talk about what we've done in the past 22 years documenting LGBT history, um, and get, put, put Julius's SIP in, in some context, and then I'll come back to specifically talk about the SIP. Prior 
They contacted the Greenwich Village Society, which was then um, run by Tim Kearns, um, who had to sponsor it. And it was fast-tracked to be listed on the state register, the national register, and then it became a National Historic Landmark all in one year's time. And as Ken indicated, up until about two and a half years ago, this was the only building in the entire United States <coughs> on the National Register of Historic Places flagged for LGBT associations. Um, there's now an effort by us and others to reevaluate probably the hundreds, if not thousands, of properties that are already listed that are not documented, um, whether it be Val Kill or Lilla Cather's um, homes or whatever else. But at any rate, um, up until last year, this was the only National Historic Landmark, and then just last June, um, the Henry Berger House in Chicago became a National Historic Landmark. Um, he was a pioneering man in the 1920s in Chicago who founded the first gay um, rights organization in the United States. So there are two National Historic Landmarks. Um, I just retired a year ago from 35 years um, on the, the research staff of the Landmarks Preservation Commission. And virtually at the same time as we were doing the old get map, um, myself and the, my colleague Gail started an effort to incorporate LGBT history in official designation reports by the city of New York. And one of our very first reports was this little historic district that we're going to place in 17th Street. This was the first use of the L word in an official city designation report. <coughs> For the few people in the room that don't know, Elsie DeWolf um, and Elizabeth Marbury lived here for 20 years. Um, their Sunday salons were very um, famous for <coughs> collecting everybody in New York society and the arts, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Elsie was, is widely considered the first interior decorator, in the, professional interior decorator in the United States. And Bessie was um, one of the world's leading female theatrical producers. Um, a few years ago, as pushed by the Greenwich Village Society, um, the commission finally designated the South Village. This was the first opportunity that I had um, to write an entire essay on the gay and lesbian presence in the South Village. And just a smattering of sites, um, which it's, it spans the gamut from the 1890s to the present. The slide on Bleecker Street is still there. It was. Um, in the early 1890s was the most notorious ferry bar. Um, they, uh, George Chauncey really goes very nicely on the whole um, concept of ferry bar. A slide in prostitutes jargon at the time was a bar where young men dressed as women and solicited men. Um, so that's what the slide was. 129 McDougal Street was one of the most famous lesbian bars in the mid-1920s, known as Eve Adams Tea Room. And um, she had a wonderful sign on the door that said, men are admitted but not welcome. <laughs> um, unfortunately, she was, she was, a number of villagers started complaining about this active lesbian bar, and she was deported. She was Polish, um, Polish Jew. And she was deported um, under the guise of, she had written a, a lesbian poetry book, so they deported her for obscenity. Um, Portofino's, um, was an Italian restaurant on Thompson Street that had very discreet um, Friday night lesbian meetings. And this became quite famous um, a few years ago because it's the place where Edie Windsor met her eventual wife in 1963. Um, and so you fast forward to the overturning of the Defense of Marriage Act. Um, Webster Hall in the East Village was designated by the commission as one of um, the single most important surviving 19th century meeting halls where conventions, political rallies, union events, and so on happened. But um, in terms of LGBT history, it's um, really notable because in the teens and 20s, um, it was famous for its Bohemian masquerade balls. And um, gays and lesbians at the time were, were welcome and felt welcome and then started sponsoring their own strictly gay events. Also in the East Village on 2nd Avenue, um, if you've never been in this movie theater, which is an interior
exterior lamp of the well is really quite extraordinary interior. It was built as a Yiddish, a Yiddish theater. <coughs> um, sorry. Um, I currently don't know anything about any sort of LGBT Yiddish theater history. I'm sure there is. And we'd love to find that out. I mean, people were chuckling, but the first uh, time a lesbian character ever appeared on stage was in a, in a Yiddish theater piece. Um, but after that period, what was really interesting is from 1945 to 1953, the basement of this theater um, was the 181 Club, uh, which was frequently referred to as the homosexual Copacabana, known for its elaborate drag shows. And then from 1953 to 1961, it was the Phoenix Theater, which was probably the single most important off-Broadway theater of the time. And then when I wrote the designation report for this, I discovered that the front office portion of the upper part of the theater um, from 1975 to 1992 was the residence of Peter Kujar, the photographer, Jackie Curtis, one of Andy Warhol's superstars, and then artist David von Vonnegorovich. Um, the Cafe Chino, which is in one of the Greenwich Village extensions that was done a few years ago, um, <clears throat> from 1958 to 1968, widely, widely considered the birth of both off-off-Broadway and gay theater in the United States. Um, when we designated both the Weehawken Street Historic District and the Gansworth Market Historic District, it was a little tentative, but I was able to document in the official reports the, the bar and club scene in both districts. Um, in the Weehawken Street District, which is only 10 buildings, it turned out that six, uh, it's 14 buildings, six of the 14 buildings were at one point or another gay bars. And obviously there's, there was a lot of late night clubbing in the Gansworth District from after 1970. Um, another recent designation was West Beth, um, which was home to Merce Cunningham's dance studio from 1971 virtually when the building opened at West Beth until um, after his death in 2010. And I guess it just moved last week or so. The, the synagogue had, had been here since um, 1975. So as a result of purely staff efforts at the Landmarks Preservation Commission, um, New York City has far and away more than any other city in the United States of official designation reports that document our history. Um, but as Ken indicated, until last year, the commission was resistant to designating even Stonewall. But Stonewall is the first and only um, specific designation. All of these efforts that I've shown you thus far were staff generated. The commission has never taken a survey, has never undertaken a survey um, to be proactive to look for sites, which is why we founded this project that we're talking about. Um, and to our great shame, there were five other cities that stepped up to the plate nationally that designated um, individual landmarks for LGBT reasons. San Francisco, Los Angeles, Chicago, Washington, D.C., <coughs> and Louisville, Kentucky. So um, one final um, landmarks commission thing that we succeeded three years ago in having an official city website Gay Pride Month show, um, there was a reinterpretation of properties that were already designated. Again, as I said before, the efforts that we were able to do before were projects that we were assigned, and as appropriate as there was LGBT history, we, we weaved it in. I was very lucky that I was assigned most of the Greenwich Village projects. Um, so a few of the examples from our reinterpretations um, a building in Novo Historic District um, near Leeper and Broadway turns out this is one of our earliest documented sites for our project. Um, Walt Whitman used to hang out. Uh, this was an underground rest cellar that was in the basement of the hotel and went under the sidewalk. And from 1859 to 1862, um, Whitman was an absolute fixture here. And it's been recently documented that this is one of the earliest documented sites, the rear portion of the Rathskeller was, uh, besides the Bohemians hanging out here, it was a known place that men looking for other men would go to the 
back of facts. Um, just another example of a, a building very near here, um, in Greenwich Village, which is really quite a wonderful story. Murray Hall was a Tammany Hall politician who lived as a man for decades, but after, after Hall's death was uh, revealed to have been a woman, um, it created an international press bureau. Um, Hall was married a number of times and usually lived close to this courthouse um, because Hall served as a bail bondsman. This building was um, the last address where Hall died in 1901. Um, one thing that our project very much wants to do is <coughs> document the architectural contribution of the um, LG LGBT community to American architecture. And um, Louis Sullivan, who's widely acclaimed by the gay community, is one of us. Um, the only did one building in New York, which is the Nicker Cross Street. It's just one of New York's absolute finest buildings. <coughs> um, just again, um, James Baldwin and Lorraine Hansberry, who were good friends, um, early black civil rights pioneers, both participated in the early gay rights movement, both lived in the village in the late 50s, early 60s. And then one final example from these slideshows, of course, is the GAA Firehouse in the Soho Historic District that was the headquarters until the arson of 1974. So getting, um, wrapping up, we're bringing us to the present and um, how we launched our project. In 2011, um, we actually were solicited by the National Trust for Historic Preservation, which had started um, branching out and realized that they needed to represent the entire United States and all the populations of the American people. So we, we put on a similar panel discussion the woman in red um, is uh, Madeline Davis, who did a really, really pioneering uh, book um, on the uh, working class living community in Buffalo. Um, she was a, an addition to our panel. So from, the, from 2011, we really, really, really wanted to, to do something, some project to kick this up into the next stage. So by 2014, we found out, as Ken mentioned, that the Department of the Interior was giving funding for underrepresented communities. So we wrote a grant application, and we did get it um, for this project. And um, after we had submitted um, the application, and we never even knew about this, but Sally Jewell in, at the podium, who's the secretary of the Department of the Interior, she came to the Stonewall and separately announced an LGBT initiative, which was basically them underlining the push that they want to target the community to come up with sites for the National Register and for ways that every aspect of the Department of Interior, whether it be national parks, national monuments, for how to deal with gay subject matter. Um, as part of that initiative, um, probably published in June online, um, there's going to be this massive tone. Uh, we did submit a chapter for that. So that brings us full circle to the sit in, and Ken will wrap it up with what our project's done for the sit in. somewhat repetitive from the video that was shown at the beginning, but kind of give more depth uh, to the actual events of the sip -in. So please indulge me by making some repeat comments. <clears throat> Tonight we're here to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the 1966 sip -in at Julius's, one of the earliest public acts of LGBT civil rights in New York City that helped end police entrapment and pave the way for legal gay bars. We're going to shine a light on this pre-Stonewall history of LGBT activism by placing it in site-specific locations and give credit where credit is due to a group of courageous and determined activists who helped pave the way for LGBT rights. This history is often overshadowed, unknown, or simply forgotten. 
I'm going to discuss our project's nomination of Julie Sist to the State National Register of Historic Places. The register is the official list of the nation's historic places worthy of designation. It is not, it is as purely honorific. It's not regulatory, as people have indicated before, and it should not be confused with local New York City landmark designation. In all cases, historic preservation designations do not affect or protect the use of the site. So we're sitting here talking about Julius's, simply lucky that Julius's has remained Julius's all these years. Otherwise, we'd be simply talking about the building that does not have a bar any longer. So the resonance of it is a little more palpable. Separately, the Greenwich Village Society is working to have Julius's made an individual landmark, as Andrew had discussed earlier. And I want to thank the Greenwich Village Society for getting Julius's eligible for listing on the state register, which is the first step in this designation process. As previously stated, of the 80,000 sites listed on the register, only seven to date are listed for this LGBT history. Making Julius's the eighth uh, is going to be probably determined next week, we're hoping. We're, having it, we're trying to have it fast-tracked in honor of the 20, uh, date on the 21st. Listing on the state national register requires owner consent and the ability for the uh, and historic integrity on the interior and the exterior from the period of significance, meaning 1966. So this means that if Dick or Randy walked into the bar now, it would have to look like it did in 1966. And I think we could all say it does. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank Andrew Dolcar, who was the lead author on this nomination, with the assistance of Jay, myself, and Amanda Davis, who was a project man uh, manager for contributing, as well as Tom Bernadine, who helped with the nomination's history, and David Carter, who's in the audience, who probably authored, who's the author of Stonewall, but whose book includes probably the most de definitive account of the sip-in uh, that we, we referenced. So David's here, and thank you. Julius's Bar is located in repaired buildings on 10th and Waverly Place. The corner structure was built in 1826 and probably had a store at the time of construction. Directories from 1834 and 37 note the presence of a grocery. The second building further west was built in 1845. And between 1920 and 1930, the entire complex was stripped of most of its exterior details and the facade was covered with rough textured te uh, stucco. And you can see these images from 39, 65, and last year. <laughs> exactly when the bar opened and the space now occupied by Julius is it's not known, although it is generally dated back to the 1860s. Stylistically, the present physical character of the bar appears to date from circa 1900. The name Julius is dates from the Prohibition era in the early 19, in the 1920s through the 1930s when the bar was a speakeasy. Uh, and these are some details that document the historic integrity. The barrels over there are from Rupert's Brewery, and in some cases, the, Rupert's was a major brewer in New York City. It was cons we were thinking that this could be what was called a tie bar, where Rupert's would go in, sell them the bar of uh, and then they would be kind of like Coca-Cola has our signs on its side of buildings. The bar would be obligated to buy beer from Rupert's. But we can't really date that because uh, it was evident from a description in 1932 called Manhattan, o Manhattan Oasis, which referred to Julius's as a madhouse without keepers, and noted that it had already been padlocked four times. So if it had been padlocked, we're thinking it may have, they may have removed the original details, but we can't confirm that for sure. We know that Julius has always been a bar and a restaurant. This fact is accented by a painted sign on the side of the wall on, at 163 West 10th Street, photographed in 1932, where Julius's advertises its delicious food. The sign uses the same script graphics that appear today in the windows of the bar. And later in the advertisement that uh, Tom showed, that it sells, it sells, in 1952, that it sells the biggest and best burgers in New York. And I'll say it with my Long Island accent. <laughs> in the 1940s and 1950s, Julius's thrived as a sports bar and celebrity hangout was considered one of the friendliest places in the village. It was so popular that the village voice was founded there. As Jay discussed, in the late 1950s and 1960s, gay life was moving west toward, in the village toward Sheridan Square and the Christopher Park area. Julius's began to attract gay patrons, often found congregating in the rear room of the bar. In 1964, Beth Bryant's The Inside Guide to Greenwich Village 
it, she discussed Julius's using euphemisms that would have been understood by those in the know. That it, quote, now attracts an amazing quantity of attractive men, theater notables. <laughs> Indeed, among the gay celebrities reported to frequent Julius's were many involved in the theater and arts, including Tennessee Williams, Edward Albee, Truman Capote, and <clears throat> Rudolf Nureyev. In 1966, Petronius, the pseudonymous author of New York Unexpurgated, described the scene at Julius's in a section of the book entitled, quote, The Fag World. Quote, couples in the back, mixed, mainly college boys in the front, not always from gay universities, but, quote, that way. But as, it, as, it, as an evident in Petronius' use of the word mixed, the bar was not exclusively a venue for gay men. Indeed, gay patrons from the time report that the management only grudgingly admitted gay patrons. And it may be the fact that Julius was in a mixed bar in the 1960s, and the fact that gay patrons tended to dress in a, and behave in a conservative manner that resulted in the establishment avoiding being shut down during various cleanup campaigns in Greenwich Village in the early and mid-1960s. It was relatively easy for the city to crack down on gay bars because the state liquor authority rules considered the mere presence of a homosexual in an establishment to be disorderly and owners could be cited for simply serving a known homosexual. In addition, the police used entrapment to arrest gay men in bars and then close the establishment. Handsome young police officers would dress in what was they considered to be stereotypical gay attire, start conversations with men they perceived to be gay, and then arrest them after any sort of proposition, or reported by many men who were arrested, no proposition at all. Bars where this sort of quote on decent behavior occurred would be cited. They had to place a sign in their window that stated these premises raided, and they generally had a police officer seated at the door during busy hours. Bars could then lose their liquor licenses and be forced to close. The result was that many legitimate, privately owned gay bars, a gay owned, privately owned and run gay bars, were forced to close, and, and mob syndicates became increasingly involved in only opening gay bars, masquerading as private clubs. Very few gay men and lesbian New Yorkers were involved in political organizing in the gay community in the 1960s. This was a time when most gay men and lesbians were deeply closeted, afraid of losing their jobs, and cowed by social stigma. So LGBT activism public and public actions such as the SIPIN were radical public statements at the time. By 1964, five, a more militant group of, Manish, of the Manishian Society in New York one election as leaders including Dick Leitch, Craig Rodwell, Rodwell, and Randy Wicker. They were determined to change laws and regulations that inhibited the lives of lesbian and gay New Yorkers and sought to gain as much po positive publicity for homosexuals as possible. They were especially interested in making it easier for gay bars to exist as legitimate businesses and to end police entrapment. With the inauguration of uh, Mayor Lindsay in January of 1966, there was hope that harassment of homosexuals might be erased. But soon after he came into office, a major crackdown occurred in, the Washington, in Washington Square. The village community complained, and on March 31st, 1966, a meeting was held at Judson, Judson Memorial Church, where Chief Inspector Sanford Garlick stated, quote, entrapment is a violation of our rules, a violation of our procedure but later made it clear that it was legal to close bars and restaurants that served homosexuals. Ironically, on the same night that Garlick was at Judson Church, assuring his audience that the New York City police did not entrap people, one or possibly two men were entrapped in Julius's by plainclothes police officers. That case, that case uh, resulted in a meeting of the activists with Mayor Lindsay in which the mayor assured the group that he was opposed to the entrapment of homosexuals both in policy and practice. Mattachine had previously hired an attorney to survey New York State's alcohol laws, which, he, which the attorney found ambiguous, citing, there is no provision in New York which flatly prohibits homosexuals from gathering in bars, and there is no provision which flatly prohibits bars from serving homosexuals. However, the law did permit premises from the law did permit premises for becoming disorderly. Courts had held that the mere presence of homosexuals made the venue disorderly. However, these cases all were based on arrests for criminal solicitation, not merely for ordering a drink. So Dick Leitch and his colleagues were determined to challenge this state liquor authority rule. The idea behind the city was a simple one. 
a few Mattachine members, led by Dick Leitch, would gather at a bar, announce that they were homosexuals, and wait to be denied service. The press would be invited to attend and witness the event. Leitch was influenced by the lunch, sit -in, lunch counter sit-ins that had been organized by African Americans in the South. He sent out a press release that told reporters to meet at the Ukrainian American Village Restaurant on West 12th Street. And um, the Ukrainian restaurant was chosen perhaps uh, because it prominently displayed a sign that said, if you are gay, please go away. The Mattachine members included Leitch. You could see, and I just want to, I was going to say it at the end, these are images that I want to thank uh, Tim McDowell. These are Fred McDowell photographs from a contact sheet that have never been seen in 50 years until tonight. So this is the first public display of that. So I want to thank Tim and his family, his mother. <laughs> This project is all about site-specific history, and no one has really reported on the specific sites that the Sibin went to beforehand. So you're gonna see these images for the first time. And what's incredibly moving, <coughs> yeah, so the, this is the Ukrainian American Village Restaurant at 12 St. Mark's Place. That's the building there on the lower left. It's an individual city landmark. But here you have them standing in front of that uh, building on the day of the Sibin which was closed. So I'll just, going back to my notes, the Ukrainian restaurant was closed because they had a sign, if you're gay, please go away. The Mattachine members, including Leitch, and you can see Craig Rodwell in the center, who later went on to establish Oscar Wilde Memorial Bookshop, and John Timmons, who uh, I believe was Dick Leitch's boyfriend at the time. Uh, and then later, Randy Wicker joined them um, at the next, at the third stop, which we'll get to. Um, like the sit-in demonstrations, the Mattachine members were conservatively dressed in jackets and ties, like already all uh, carried in that attache case. But the group was late and the restaurant had been closed after being told by the assembled reporters about the purpose of the event. There were reporters from various papers, including the New York Times and the Village Voice, with, with its photographer Fred McDowell in tow, who documented the entire event. So after going to, after finding defeat here, they made a second stop. So the group moved to Howard Johnson's on the corner of 6th Avenue and 8th Street, where they sat in a booth, asked to see the manager, and then announced that they were homosexuals and requested a drink. The manager laughed at them, and they were served. <laughs> <laughs> so again, the same these photographs for the first time today, you can see the, the serious shot, and then the announcement shot, which sort of, <coughs> made the point move, and they had to reconnoiter and go to another location. <laughs> so, I guess it's go west, young man, in the way that they're heading west. So they headed to the Waikiki, which a similar, uh, a similar response started here. Uh, the Waikiki, which is literally, when you go out tonight, look across the street at Umani Burger, and that was Luigi, that was this photograph on the lower right, left, is uh, showing from 1965. That's when it was Luigi's. This, the, the event took place probably a year later, but you could see them in the Waikiki with a little festival uh, decor there. So after the Waikiki, um, they were, uh, to quote the village voice, Frustrated by hospitality, <laughs> it was on to Julius's. They were fairly certain that they would be denied drinks at Julius's since the bar had recently been raided and patrons entrapped and its management would be sensitive about serving gay men. The voice reported that the sign behind the bar read, patrons must face the bar while drinking. So what was now four managing members, Litch stated to the bartender, we are homosexuals and we would like a drink. There was a moment when it was unclear what was going to happen next, but Lich added, you can't serve us if we are homosexuals. <laughs> to which the bartender said no, and placed his hand over the glass, an action that was preserved in what is now the infamous photograph taken by Fred McDowell of the Village Voice. So here you have it, the famous sit-in. <laughs> Uh, Dick Leitch is looking at the bartender to his, well, on the left of the photograph is John Timmons, there's Randy Wick, uh, uh, sorry, Craig, Craig Rodwell, and then looking over is Randy Wick. So that was the city. At least two newspapers reported on this event, 
a snide piece in the New York Times, and a complete and sympathetic account in the Village Voice. And you can see the voices on the left, where three homosexuals in search of a drink became the had a catch all. And it's a very thorough documentation, including that photograph there, where the Times was a little less uh, sincere of what was taking place at that event. The rejection came at, at Julius's came to a relief of uh, Timmins, who quipped, quote, another bourbon and water, and I would have been under the table. <laughs> Before the reporters dispersed, the managing members announced that the society would, quote, file a complaint with the state liquor authority against Julius's, contending that they, that they were unfairly discriminated against. They also offered to pay any legal expenses incurred by Julius's. The day after the sip-in, the managing issued a press release which provided a synopsis of the day's events. The publicity garnered by the sit-in forced the state liquor authority to make a statement about its rules regarding the serving of homosexuals in bars and restaurants. Although, the, although denying that the authority had received such a complaint, state liquor authority David Hotstetter stated that they would take no action against licensed establishments that refused to serve homosexuals, but he also denied that the state liquor authority ever told licensees that they should not serve homosexuals. A statement that was clearly false, considering the significant number of gay bars that had lost their licenses. This very public announcement did negate the generally understood rule that bartenders could, under no circumstances, serve a known homosexual. While the state liquor authority refused to take any formal action against Julius's or other bars that refused to serve gay men and lesbians, the newly empowered New York City Human, uh, Commission on Human Rights was interested and announced that it would use its powers of persuasion to end discrimination against homosexuals. The Commission on Human Rights was chaired by its first African-American commissioner, lawyer and civil rights activist William Booth, who publicly expressed his concern for equal rights for all. However, the law only permitted the commission to investigate discrimination based on sex. Yet the publicity resulting, resulting in Chairman Booth's announcement provided a, public, a positive public response to the Madison Society's efforts to assure that gay men and lesbians who could congregate and be served in bars. Many sources <clears throat> excuse me, refer to a lawsuit brought forward by the Madison Society over this case, but no such lawsuit ever was filed. However, another suit related to the, relating to entrapment at Julius's was decided by the Appellate Division of the State Supreme Court in March of 1967, and that's the headline from that there. As a result of the successes at Madison, uh, as a result of the successes in Madison's two-pronged efforts, one to stop entrapment and the other to assure that homosexuals could legally congregate in bars and restaurants and order drinks, crackdowns on legitimate gay bars decreased. Although, as evident in Stonewall, they did not stop forever. The new ruling began to make it easier for non-mob-associated gay and lesbian bars to open and flourish, and for the bar to become a central social space for urban LGBT New Yorkers over the next several decades. The Julius Sisipin is an early example of organized political action towards gay civil rights in New York City, and it is now seen as a symbolic turning point in the treatment of homosexuals in the city. And I just want to show, we did a little recreation of us there a couple of months ago. Um, and lastly, I want to just acknowledge Stonewall and Julius is, is a start, but there's still much more to be done. Remember that LGBT history is part of American history and world history, and our sites deserve listing along other sites, alongside the other sites of history representing every group that contributed to the world's historic patrimony. So we are looking for um, additional sites. We have about 500 on our list. Um, so if you have any interest in submitting them, we are launching a website. Uh, we have a starter website, but please submit your inquiries or suggestions to us here. But I want to again thank Dick Leitch and Randy Wicker for all those efforts. Uh, to make the sip in the sip in and change the course of history. So thank you. A terrific job, guys. I haven't been that quiet for so long in my whole life. <laughs> thank you. I learned a whole lot. Um, it was very sweet. I just want to say something about this wonderful building. It was very sweet to hear the bell ringing uh, a half hour ago. And I want to salute my mentor and dear friend, and a friend of all of ours, Margo Gale, who saved this building by getting that clock working and galvanizing the community when the city was about to tear the building down. 
I also want to take the opportunity, I was a National Park Service Ranger at the Statue of Liberty in Ellis Island, and I want to take the opportunity uh, to introduce the superintendent of the Statue of Liberty right over here, John. We're going to have to change his name at Ellis Island, it's a handle. Uh, but it, it's flattering that, that you're willing to come here because the Department of the Interior is so crucial in the efforts of these gentlemen here. Uh, we're going to do a Q&A. Uh, Dick, I would like you to come up here and join us if you'd like. Does that microphone work? Yes. That, that is one little mic. And Ellen, if, at any point, if you want to say hello to the group, that would be just fine as well. Because she, she is very, she's gotten a, a terrific, terrific education about gay life and about managing a gay bar in the West Village <laughs> that people hold very, very dearly. So it was, has not been an easy task for her. Thank you all for showing up for us. Uh, as I recall, maybe 15 years ago, there was a major renovation of Julius's. They ripped out a lot of the interior, but I think they put everything back. Can you discuss the that? Building, the building collapsed in uh, 1981 or 2, right? 82. And uh, they had to basically they shored it up and basically had to rebuild it. And uh, kudos to Freddie Lutz, the owner of the time, because the patrons were bereft, okay? Uh, there is a story that one of the old timers showed up and there was a sign on the door, it's closed. And he had a heart attack right there. People <laughs> uh, we were very upset. But uh, Freddie, uh, Bought everybody drinks for the following week over at uh, the Nine Circle right over here. And they managed to keep the building, the bar, running while they recreated the building outside. So it's a miracle that survived. Nightmare. You know an old building like that? Uh, Andy Hum, I just want to point out that the SLA did not let up on its homophobia. In the 80s, it uh, sent uh, men into the SLA, got men into the Duchess of another lesbian bar, and so we demanded to be served. And all they said was, you know, you'd probably be happy to on the block. And you can't serve you. They closed both bars. Thousands of people turned out in the streets, and we couldn't get them reopened. And entrapment didn't end. Bloomberg was doing it to porn shops just a few years ago to close them. A total false arrest, outrageous. That we stopped. We did stop that. My question, I, I do have a question that I've listened to on this. Who the hell is Julius? <laughs> Who's Julius? I, I, you know, I actually, I thought I had found him. Uh, this fellow showed up a couple of years ago, and he said, I am Julius's grandson. So from St. Louis. So I figured this is it. And uh, I actually put together a program here as Father GDSHP. I said, who is Julius? Who is Julius? Only to find out his grandfather's working in a place on Broadway. We don't know. We don't know whether it's the dog. Or that that said, when we were putting together the National Register nomination, the only thing that mentioned that, and I think it's believable because at the time, the 1933, there's a speakeasy guide um, that had chapters on on the speakeasies, and they say in that in 1933 that it was named after an earlier bartender, so that's the only thing we saw that even refers to the name. Yeah. I, I think it's conceivable. Yes? I would be curious to hear from the current owner about what is the learning curve for owning a gay ball. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs>
gain the respect of my employees. And um, once my husband passed away, I was thrown into uh, running a bar that, you know, uh, I maybe visited four times in the whole time that we opened. And all of a sudden I found myself um, putting cases of beer away, doing inventory. I've done it all, you know, from soup to nuts. And, you know, I'm just the, the person that goes in, I run everything, I'm just happy that everybody's having a great time and that they continue to have their living room, their wonderful living room. And my intention is never to let that go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Dick, yeah. Um, um, we've heard from people who, who are We've heard from people who studied and researched what you experienced and you led. What do you want us to know of the event and of your experience of it? You heard from people who are historians. What did you what do you want me to learn from the event? It should always you know you should always laugh at yourself to make what you want to do. 